Our topic this evening is Christian pacifism and nonviolence. This is a, a topic in particular in my denomination and community of Christ that we have been reflecting on for a couple years, and uh, we're going to continue thinking about this. This uh, image that we have in the background of the title card here um, is a painting, a Christian primitivist painting by a Quaker in the 19th century um, uh, who is essentially having a vision of the lion shall lie down with the lamb and the child shall lead them this vision of um, the peaceable kingdom as expressed in Isaiah. But in the background of this, there's also this idea that they, of kind of creating a peaceable or a vision of that, a utopia, the Quakers uh, meeting with indigenous Americans trying to have a peaceful coexistence in Pennsylvania. It's also uh, a vision that didn't really work out. Uh, and in fact, is even though the Quakers are um, a famously um, pacifist, uh, one of the traditional Christian peace churches, um, it turns out that when you actually are in charge of running a state, it becomes uh, much more complicated in practice to be pacifist, especially when you know war, greater wars happen, uh, wars between uh, settlers and indigenous peoples and the colonial powers. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about why we're thinking about this topic in Community of Christ and how Community of Christ works. This is a picture of uh, the World Conference of Community of Christ, which occurs every three years. This is the auditorium in Independence, Missouri, which is the international headquarters of the church. The World Conference, held triennially, is the governing body for Community of Christ as an international denomination. So the way it works is congregations like mine elect delegates and also send less legislation to mission center conferences, which is like a regional conference. The mission center conference then, in turn, sends delegates and legislation to the World Conference, which enacts resolutions for the denomination. And so the last World Conference uh, was in 2019. We were gonna have one this year, because it's been three years, but because of COVID, it's been postponed until next year. So in that last conference in 2019, the United Kingdom and Western European mission centers sent a resolution to the conference on nonviolence. And that resolution said in part, resolved that community of Christ reject all forms of violence, including acts of terrorism, war, and financing wars, and act upon Christ's invitation to practice nonviolence and confront and resist injustice. So although the church is committed to promoting peace, uh, peace is both one of our mission initiatives and also one of the enduring principles we uphold. Our headquarters temple is dedicated to peace and peace is actually the motto that's emblazoned on our uh, seal, which is again, the lion and the lamb and the child leading them. Um, nevertheless, the resolution was controversial because it condemns essentially all violence and war without what we would normally sometimes have as an out clause in the case of justifiable self-defense. So um, because you know, delegates weren't prepared uh, internationally to really um, unpack what the, what the UK and Western European churches were getting at, uh, they instead accepted a substitute resolution. So they, instead of voting on or voting against uh, the proposed resolution, they substituted a, a re resolution that urged members around the world to think about nonviolence and to be studying it and pondering it, praying about it and so on in advance of the next World Conference, which will now be held next year. So um, I'm actually, um, one of the reasons I'm thinking about this especially right now is uh, next month, um, I'm going to be facilitating courses in Polynesia. So um, Community of Christ, excuse me, <coughs> Community of Christ was established in Polynesia in the 1840s, making it one of the core heritage zones of the church. You maybe not see it in this picture here, but um, when, they, when the 
uh, flags are emblazoned all around the auditorium. They're in order that the um, country that was where the church was established. And so it starts out the United States, Canada, England, Australia, then French Polynesia. So it's really right at the beginning of uh, the church's story. So this is going to be my first overseas trip since the pandemic. And so I'm going to Tahiti to facilitate courses on nonviolence and peace in the Christian tradition. And also we're going to have courses on justice and inclusion for all, including things like human sexuality, as the um, Polynesian church will probably soon be having a uh, national conference where they will vote on you know, full LGBT inclusion and priesthood and so forth uh, in their area of the church. So for us here in Toronto, um, our Sunday service, which is called Beyond the Walls, that has been translated into English, Spanish, and French since the beginning of the pandemic, which has allowed people whose primary language is French or one of their two languages in addition to Tahitian as a language, Polynesian. Um, so consistently, French Polynesia draws the third highest number of viewers each week after the United States and Canada. And we even had last fall an entire service with ministers and singers from Tahiti. So we have made lots of wonderful connections with members of the church in Tahiti. And so I'm actually really looking forward to meeting with everybody in person and going through these courses. And so that's one of the reasons why we're talking about this topic tonight. So among the teaching resources that was available to me and that I've looked at for um, doing this uh, presentation tonight is a book, a course book called Four Approaches to Violence. And it's produced by Community of Christ members, Andrew Bolton, L. Ray Henriksen, and David Anderson. So their goal in making this resource was to help inform church members' understanding of nonviolence, sort of as we're supposed to be doing as a church in accordance with that World Conference resolution that we had a couple years ago. Okay, so the four approaches um, that we're going to talk that they talk about in the booklet and that I'm going to talk about tonight are pacifism, holy war, just war, and just peace. Um, and we'll look at each one of those in a little bit of detail. So pacifism, we'll start with. Um, there are very significant precedents for pacifism and to responding to violence with nonviolence um, kind of throughout the New Testament. So we've talked a lot about how different in a way um, the earliest Christianities, Jesus, the historical Jesus and the Jesus movement are um, as kind of radical um, protest kinds of movements almost uh, in comparison to once you uh, once a, a religion becomes institutionalized and um, has all of these institutionalizing tendencies, which happens inevitably, but you know it's been thousands of years here. So um, Christianity continuously faces all the pressures of institutions uh, that institutions have to enforce rather than to challenge norms and the status quo. It really does trace its origins to radicals who did quite the opposite. And so um, there are all sorts of teachings that are recorded from Jesus in the Gospels. Um, the congregation of the um, uh, that Jesus gathered around him, uh, he describes them when, in different characteristics when he says they are blessed. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Um, and one of the teachings recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, um, Jesus revises what is sometimes called the lex talionis, the law of retaliation that is found in Leviticus. So he says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anybody wants to sue you in court and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. So the last there being, um, one of the things that the Roman government could do is um, 
essentially force peasants to do labor in support of the army. So in other words, you could carry, be uh, in, in made to carry some of the baggage for a mile or something like that. Go a second mile if you're called on, in, impressed into that sort of corvée labor service. Um, even you're supposed to love your enemies, even uh, even in light of the problem of evil. So, again, in Matthew it says Jesus says, "You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So, in other words, um, you're even see, even though you're seeing uh, that God is actually um, making the same sun rise on evil and good. In other words, there is no um, you're not seeing evil people immediately being punished for doing bad things. So, in other words, why and and also good people, righteous people are suffering. So that's like the problem of evil, right? Even despite that. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Um, likewise, um, our earliest Christian writer who's writing Survive, Paul, gives the same kind of counsel, counsel that echoes the same way. So in his letter to the Romans, he writes, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, my dear friends, but leave good room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. So leave that to the God, not, to, not anything to you to do. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, uh, four approaches to violence then cites another 30 passages from the New Testament, where Christians are counseled to some form of non-retaliation. So when they are confronted um, with uh, something like, again, being forced into corvée labor or, or, or someone's doing something bad to them, um, their response is to be, you know, not retaliate, don't curse, do not litigate, endure, forbear, be at peace. There's also gospel stories include, that include narrative examples. So, for example, when Jesus is betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane by Judas, um, one of his disciples, it's an, it's an unnamed disciple in the Synoptic Gospels, but it's named as Simon Peter in the Gospel of John, um, decides to resist the arresters and actually cuts off uh, one, of the, uh, one of the slaves of the people that are arresting uh, Jesus. And Jesus tells him to stop doing that. He actually heals the, the person's ear uh, and goes ahead and uh, does not resist arrest. So, so again, not confronting uh, violence with violence, but rather with nonviolence. So we've established in previous lectures on the historical Jesus and on early Christianities, Jesus was probably part of a community, an intentional community that focused on a group of spiritual men and women who all shared everything, all their property and so forth in common, and they lived as mendicants, which is to say, begging for their daily bread. They rejected all other worldly entanglements, and that included promoting nonviolent responses to often very violent persecution. Now, there would have been a larger supporting Christian community that was continuing to uh, be involved in, or proto-Christian, pre-Christian, uh, community that is uh, continuing to be entangled with uh, worldly things. And so they would have property and they would actually be giving alms and so on to this um, more, more spiritual, kind of almost monk-like uh, or friar-like community um, of the people who have made this, uh, you know, these kind of renunciations of property and so forth. Um, some some cases might be called the disciples or the apostles. So, you know, the reality is because of this disconnect in a way between those um, radical origins of the Jesus movement uh, and the kind of institutional quality of uh, of Christianity as it's existed for a couple thousand years, 
Christians tend to just read Scripture uh, the way they've always read it, as kind of comforting proof texts that reinforce existing institutional views. But if instead they really open up their minds to what the text says, if they look at it with an eye of a historian, what it says actually in the real historical context, that may um, result in actually exposing people to teachings of Jesus that are quite radical indeed. And in fact, if you read the text too closely, that can put committed Christians in dangers of becoming a Cathar or a Lollard or a Franciscan or a poor Clare or an Anabaptist, a Mennonite or a Quaker, depending on if you were focused on, for example, um, some of the teachings on peace and nonviolence and so forth. Um, even Community of Christ's tradition began with a group of disciples who yearned to restore um, and live the church as it was described in the book of Acts. So the goal is um, to essentially go back and only do those kind of things that were read. And they did a bunch of experiments, for example, because the book of Acts says that the early uh, disciples uh, shared things in common. And so um, there were several experiments where they created what was called United Orders, where they share property together, creating agricultural co-ops and so forth um, in order to try to do those, those kinds of things. And also in our tradition, um, early on, there is a kind of a, um, an attempt to also live Christian pacifism, um, but sometimes in the face of oppo violent opposition and persecution, especially on the uh, American frontier and so forth. Um, the church's tradition also started to experiment with different kinds of militant, militant, uh, militantism, and this also didn't always end very well. So throughout history, there have been powerful examples of Christian pacifists who confront violence with nonviolence, and nonviolence can be an extremely effective means to promote change while retaining moral high ground. And so even, for example, in the civil rights movement, in the case of just amazingly entrenched uh, bigotry, systematic racism that the, was faced in the society, continues to this day, but was, you know, you know amazingly even worse in the 1960s. Um, nevertheless, uh, nonviolent confrontation with the forces of violence is always going to be asymmetric because violent forces often react with violence, which can often lead, in many cases anyway, to, to martyrdoms uh, and assassinations, as in the case also even with Martin Luther King Jr. So that's kind of a thumbnail of, of pacifism, um, both at the beginning and also all the way up to the present as a rich tradition in Christianity. Next, I want to look at holy war. So in, the, in as much as there's a bunch of scriptural precedents and, and admonitions for pacifism and uh, reacting um, to uh, violence with, with nonviolence or non-reactions or peaceful reactions uh, in the New Testament, there's also precedent in scripture for holy war. So the Exodus story, um, the story from, you know, the Pentateuch, the part of the Bible, the Torah in the Hebrew Bible, um, which is essentially almost the most important part of the Old Testament. Um, in that story, the land that God promises to give the children of Israel is inhabited by numerous peoples that are collectively called Canaanites. So God commands the Israelites to attack and exterminate all the Canaanites and exterminate them all the way, including all their livestock in wars that fall into the category of holy war rather than just war, since the um, Canaanites are not the aggressors in these wars. They are simply defending themselves and being exterminated. And uh, so the war wouldn't fit into just war doctrine, as we'll see. Uh, when we define that, but is presumably holy since it's being commanded here anyway. It's fought in God's name. So if we read in the beginning of chapter 7 in Deuteronomy, um, God is saying to Moses, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're about to enter and occupy, and he clears away the many nations before you, 
the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations mightier and more numerous than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, you must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for that would turn away your children from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But this is how you must deal with them. Break down their altars, smash their pillars, hew down their sacred poles and burn their idols with fire for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. So this is a um, uh, divine order to exterminate, uh, essentially a divine uh, order for genocide. And so it is giving, um, in, in any event, a scriptural precedent for this kind of war. It does turn out um, now historians and archaeologists and linguists and so forth are pretty well agreed that um, this is not historical. Um, so in fact, the uh, children of Israel are not aliens who came from uh, slavery in the land of Egypt or something like that. They, the Exodus story is not uh, his history. Rather, uh, the Israelite people are the same ethnically as the Canaanites, and they essentially simply um, evolved together as a, out of, and came out of that group as a new identity uh, rather than anybody who came in. So in other words, there is no archaeological record of um, a foreign, you know, people coming in and actually uh, smashing and destroying all the cities. Um, but in, in any event, even though it didn't happen, it's still in the book as a precedent, you know, which was important. People in the past didn't realize it didn't happen. So um, beginning in the 11th century, medieval Christians justified, for example, warfare against Muslims as holy wars. Um, originally, they're called just armed pilgrimages. They don't have a name for it, but it later the word developed uh, the crusade, taking the cross and going on a holy war uh, for uh, Christ. So Christian knights are actually absolved of sins uh, by engaging in violence against uh, people outside the religion in this conception. So um, ironically, the Crusades actually had their origin in um, a peace movement in Christianity, a movement called the Peace of God and the Truce of God movement uh, that occurred in sort of the Frankish kingdoms and what became France. Essentially, um, there was a breakdown of imperial control and local um, knights and, and counts and so forth were all fighting each other, uh, kind of unceasing warfare, and clerics were trying to get people to agree to different kinds of the peace of God, the truce of God, so that, for example, anyway, you would at least wouldn't have your war on, on Sunday or holy days where you would have a certain season um, where you would where, would cease fighting or in, in general just try to lessen fighting between Christians. Um, but building on that later, um, since kind of the job of knights is fighting, um, conceptually it turned to the idea, well, instead of fighting each other and other Christians, you'd be justified in you doing your fighting that you're doing when it's directed at non-Christians. And so ultimately, um, in addition to uh, sending crusades against the Muslims in, um, uh, in you know, kind of Syria and Palestine and Egypt, um, also there are essentially crusade-like uh, functions in the Reconquista as uh, people are fighting in Spain and also actually also in Sicily against Muslims and crusades were also launched against uh, the Lithuanians who were the last uh, pagan people in Europe that were eventually brought under uh, control of the Crusader Knights and, and Christianized. Um, but even more than um, holy war against uh, people outside of the religion, um, there was an even, let's say, a longer standing and more uh, 
committed, uh, people were more, longer standing and more committed to the idea that violence uh, can and should be used against heretics within the body of Christendom. So violence, including holy wars against perceived heretics, has an even longer history. Um, already when the crusading movement got going right away, the church called a crusade against the Cathars in southern France in the early 13th century. So the Cathars um, are one of these groups who kind of someone at some point or other, you know, got to reading some of the teachings of Jesus um, and people who were essentially a, a lay pious group um, of spiritualists tried to essentially live out um, their kind of spiritual understanding of that. Um, they developed their own theology that diverged a lot from mainstream Christianity in terms of uh, being dualist, we've had a whole lecture on the Cathars, but part of their, their anti-materialist, their anti-procreation and so on, um, they're, you know, vegetarian or piscatarian, uh, pescatarian, and then they also, though, are probably pacifists. And um, uh, the Crusaders largely, as a result, um, uh, mostly massacre everybody. So, for example, when the Crusaders took control of the city of Béziers in 1209, the papal legate, who is in charge of the army, commanded, kill them all, God will know his own. So we, we don't even have to worry about which ones of these people in the city are actual Cathars and who are simply sympathetic to them or so on. Um, God is going to sort it out. And according to the Legate's report, the Crusaders put almost 20,000 people to death in Béziers in that massacre. Um, there's no way that that's true, so the town wouldn't have had anywhere near that many people, but in the, there's all of numbers in ancient history and the Middle Ages, people always exaggerate the numbers. They don't you know, sit around and count them all. Nevertheless, they're, they're showing kind of the scale um, of what they're doing without any kind of remorse. Um, it's just even exaggerating the, to get more credit for killing more. Um, from antiquity, heresy was usually allegorized as a disease uh, invading the body of the Christian community. And so, the, you know, fighting the way you fight the disease, you have to eradicate a disease in order to preserve the body. And so um, authorities, including even a great thinker like Thomas Aquinas, uh, justified executing heretics, calling them dumb animals, for example. So um, when you dehumanize your enemies, this is part of the components of, you know, like what we have in modern day times where you have genocide. One of the ways that people are able to condone genocide is effectively by dehumanizing um, your opponents. Um, this is certainly also, um, you know, very true in the, uh, the different imperial wars, the wars of the imperial era and the colonialism, because uh, again, the imperial powers with various racist ideologies, they felt themselves were, were, more, uh, were more human than other people were less and that they would, and they were justified in, 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 in some cases, very, very enormous massacres. And, you know, that's certainly true in North America in terms of the uh, settler uh, militaries dealing with um, uh, indigenous peoples who were routinely massacred. So um, anyway, the wars of religion uh, kind of got, brought this all to kind of an end and, and certainly kind of the idea of holy war is very much out of favor, uh, I think pretty much across Christianity at this point. So the Protestant Reformation, which began in 1517, set, uh, set off a series of European wars of religion, um, the most, maybe the most horrific of which is the Thirty Years War, that's in the beginning of the 16, I'm sorry, 17th century. It's fought mostly in the Holy Roman Empire in Germany, um, where uh, it itself alone maybe resulted in some four and a half million to eight million deaths in some parts of Germany, which are the um, which were the setting of the war. As much as 50 percent of the population was killed. Um, so, the Peace of Westphalia that ends that Thirty Years' War. Um, kind of enshrined a principle, all right, um, you know, some princes here and some lands are going to be Protestant and some are going to be Catholic. And essentially, um, in the places where there are Protestant princes, it's okay that it's going to be a Protestant state in Germany. And in the places where there's Catholic 
princes, that's going to be a Catholic state. And so it is really on the beginning of um, an idea that Christians could agree to disagree about religion, and they did not come to that idea um, willingly or as their first thought. They decided to kill 8 million people before they could get to that point, and, uh, which they just had to accept. Uh, and, but it's kind of the basis for where we're getting to our more modern um, idea of religious freedom and toleration and so forth. So uh, that's kind of holy war, the uh, precedence for it, and really how it's fallen out of favor after um, a lot of uh, eager usage of it in the Middle Ages especially. Um, we'll go now to just war theory. So Augustine of Hippo, which is a part of North Africa, a town in North Africa, um, was among the most influential ancient Christian philosophers who, and theologians who wrote in Latin. And he's active in an era when Christianity was becoming the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. He was the first Christian thinker to consider warfare systematically. Um, if the empire now is to becoming Christian, the emperors are now Christian, how should a Christian empire understand war? It wasn't something that um, the small, persecuted, more radical, more pacifist, early Christian community ever really had to consider. Now it's becoming a necessity uh, for the emperors, for example, to consider what, th what they should be doing um, since warfare is primarily one of the primary job of the emperor. So again, um, in terms of becoming the dominant religion of the empire, uh, there's an irony. So Christianity, which had been um, uh, pacifist and a, uh, and a kind of a pacifist and peace movement, it was set on the path to become the dominant religion in Rome because one of the rival emperors interpreted a military victory that he had against a rival emperor uh, he interpreted that as the intervention of the Christian God on his side. In other words, that the Christian God was more powerful than the other gods that were working behind uh, the other rivals and caused him to have a military victory. So in response to a vision that he had in th the year 312, uh, in which he said he saw a symbol and, and he was told in this symbol he would get victory, Constantine had his soldiers paint uh, the symbols XP or Cairo on their um, shields as they entered battle. And so Cairo are the first two letters of the word Christ in Greek. And so with that bit of um, kind of superstitious magic and, a, uh, and proving that the Christian God is militant and is actually um, uh, causing, you know, bringing victory, that kind of set Constantine on the path of learning more about Christianity. He ultimately is much more understands what it's about and converts to it, um, but he gets there in not in a way that has anything to do with uh, Christianity's uh, peace origins, for example. So as the first emperor to convert to Christianity, under his patronage, Constantine helped organize the religion into a single institution that was led by ecumenical or worldwide councils, worldwide in the sense of the oikumenoi, the area under the control of the Roman Empire, uh, worldwide councils which agreed on a set of beliefs and then articulated a creed so that all Christians could say, yes, we all believe this, as opposed to earlier eras when Christian, Christians uh, were able to believe all kinds of radically different things than each other uh, in the earlier times as we've seen in our lectures. So, Constantine also refounded the uh, city of Byzantium as Constantinople, which he envisioned as a new Rome that would be essentially a Christianized version with Christian um, churches and shrines and so forth as an alternative to uh, the Rome that is dominated by pagan shrines and temples and so forth and continued to be so such. Um, Rome, so the movement by this time uh, had changed. So again, the emperors are largely um, 
uh, figures that are in charge of the army and the defense of the frontiers and, and, the, and so forth. Uh, and the city of Rome um, has nothing to do with, uh, it's not a defensible location in terms of what the empire had become. So essentially the Roman emperors had abandoned Rome uh, for a long time before this as a political center and they'd held their courts on the various areas of the frontier where they could provide uh, defenses, be it in in Trier in Germany or in Milan or Ravenna or now here in Constantinople or over in Antioch or something like that in Syria where they are able to immediately address the frontier zones. And so Rome now um, continues to have uh, cultural uh, importance, but it is no longer really involved with the, with the government at this point. So at the time of Constantine's conversion, there was still only a small fraction of the Roman population who were Christians, but this started to kind of increase more rapidly due to imperial patronage. It wasn't a foregone conclusion, however, that this would become, that you know, Christ, the Roman Empire would become fully Christian. And indeed, when Constantine's nephew, Julian, assumed power. Um, he wanted to turn back the clock. He returned imperial patronage to the old gods. And um, when what he kind of found out is that, um, you know, what we, we don't even have a name for, we call it paganism from a, from a um, Christian perspective. Um, the old gods and the religions, you know, are lumped together and we can call it paganism. But in fact, actually, um, there was no unity to any of it. And um, actually Julian's attempts to patronize kind of these various uh, disjointed uh, old cults and, and schools and other kinds of shrines and so forth um, met with a very apathetic response. And so he actually began to organize them into a religion that is actually modeled on a Christian church. And so had he uh, been able to have a long rule, he only ruled um, just a couple years, he had a very long rule, he might have succeeded in creating a, a what we might call a pagan church, but um, it would have been very different from uh, what paganism had been beforehand, um, and it would have been very similar to what the Christian church was like in a way, even if it had a different um, basis. However, Julian's short reign in death uh, after a failed invasion of the Persian Empire ended his ambitions as his successors returned their patronage to the Christian church. By the reign of Theodosius the Great, the last emperor of the unified empire, Christianity was more and more merging into the state religion of Rome. And in the fifth century, the Roman empire was also increasingly under pressure from peoples across the frontiers. So the Germanic confederations had been in direct connect, connection with the Romans for centuries. And so they had been highly uh, Romanized, and they were also, though, had uh, much of military prowess and were often being employed by the Roman Empire as mercenaries. Meanwhile, they are under pressure from um, a new group coming out of Central Asia, the Huns, and so they uh, seek refuge within the empire's borders rather than having to fight Huns. So in 410, the Visigoths, who had been former allies of the Eastern Empire, sacked the city of Rome the first time the city had fallen to an invader in nearly eight centuries. And so that's the backdrop when Augustine is formulating the idea of just war within a Christian context. So uh, it's, there's a lot of war going on around him, and in some cases a defensive war as uh, people are penetrating into the imperial frontiers and even um, to the city of Rome itself. So. Within that context, Augustine uh, wants to examine two components. So the first is, when is it justified to go to war? So your jus ad bellum, when can you go to war justly? And what sorts of conduct are justified in war, your jus in bello? So what is, uh, what is a just way to conduct a war? And Augustine's work, um, you know, after all these centuries, this continues to be the position of the Catholic Church to this day. So the jus ad bellum concerns justification that a nation must give in order for it to have the moral right to wage war on another nation. Um, and so according to Augustine, this rests on four main criteria, which is to say one just authority, 
is the decision to go to war based on a legitimate political and legal process. And so um, I just seem using as an example here, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signing a formal declaration of war against Nazi Germany in 1941. Um, it's not saying here whether this is entirely, you know, a just war or not. The idea here is though, there was a um, legitimate political process in terms of written into the United States Constitution. Um, the Congress has the power to declare war, which the president then is, you know, is signing and enacting and so on. And that used to be, you know, like a, uh, a process that was uh, always fulfilled, but I don't think that any of the wars have been declared maybe since uh, World War II like this. But anyway, that was um, not that there's maybe not a different authority, there's authorizing authorities and so forth, but this is an example of how, uh, what Augustine is at talking about. Two, just cause. Has a wrong been committed to which war is the appropriate response? And so, um, you know, an example would be, uh, perhaps for from the Ukrainian perspective, uh, they got invaded by a neighboring power. Um, that is, they might be, they might say that that's our casus belli, that is our, um, a wrong uh, that has been committed to us, to which us fighting a war with them back is the appropriate response. Um, next though is right intention. Is the response proportional to the cause? Is the war action then limited to righting the wrong and going no further? So in this case, in that Ukrainian uh, example, if the, um, the response is to uh, right the wrong of essentially uh, pushing the invaders out of your territory, um, if other, if you, if you or your allies start articulating additional goals like, well, we also want to um, uh, limit the uh, attacking country's capacity to ever make war in the future, or we want to uh, replace their government or something like that, um, that may, according to Augustine anyway, that may be taking that beyond uh, the proportional response to the cause the right intention. And finally, and this is the most maybe important one, the last resort, you know, has every other means of righting the wrong been attempted sincerely so that no other option but war remains. And so, I mean, I have on here the, a picture here of the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914. This is the um, kind of, in some cases it seems like, a uh, crazy out of proportion event uh, where the, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, you know, being assassinated by um, kind of a, a, a Serbian gunman uh, ends up leading to the biggest war the world had ever seen up to that date um, as people um, uh, fought what I think almost all historians uh, look back upon and see as a completely um, unnecessary war, um, so that uh, the different great powers continuously um, decided that they wanted to use war uh, to solve these different crises rather than looking for a sincere um, other way to redress uh, uh, the different issues. So for example, in this particular, you know, as starting it off, the Austrians asked for really crippling um, and, and uh, response from Serbia. Um, which, you know, was maybe only so more or less guilty or not, depending on how, you know, the, how much this guy is an agent of actually Serbia, uh, with the idea of either humiliating Serbia or forcing, there to be, forcing it into war, which triggered all the rest of the, um, the great powers and alliances and so forth, World War I. Okay, so in addition to that, the cause, that's the, uh, you know, of war, you know, even if you've satisfied the criteria for morally going to war, according to just Augustine, there are still moral limits on what the state may do in prosecuting a war. So a war that a state begins with a just cause can nevertheless become an unjust war if its conduct in the war is either one, disproportionate, or two, indiscriminate. So according to Augustine, 
uh, proportionality, the degree of the force, um, sorry, the allowable force used in the war must be measured against the force required to correct the cause, the just cause that you're in, and must be limited to the just intention. Um, and so, uh, inflicting far greater punishment on the opponent than was than the original wrong being righted, or carrying out war aims past the just intention are disproportionate responses. And there's lots of examples. For example, I've mentioned in the imperial wars of the 19th and early 20th centuries, um, where imperial powers they might have faced a, um, let's say, a, like a in the rebellion that happened in India in the middle of the 19th century, um, they may have had faced several thousand or people uh, getting killed or something like that in a rebellion against imperial rule, but the response is then to kill hundreds of thousands of people and so forth. Uh, and so that happened in a lot of cases where um, a, an imperial power with you know, a relatively sm small army um, but lots and lots of very deadly technology use that in order to um, suppress much larger populations uh, in their empires. Okay, the other part besides proportional, proportional response is discrimination. And so according to Augustine, to conduct war justly, combatants must discriminate between, uh, com you know, they're attacking the combatants and non-combatants. They're supposed to attack military targets, not civilian targets. So innocent non-military people are never legitimate targets in war. Um, and so we've also talked about the idea of World War II as a just war that in some cases a lot of people would like to cite that as the most uh, just war, but both because there were lots of wrongs that were needing to be righted and so on. Uh, nevertheless, both sides, um, it was a total war and both sides also had uh, civilian targets. Um, so we I'm just up here, just one of the examples. So firebombing Tokyo resulting in 100,000 civilian deaths, a million made homeless. Um, you know, all the sides in World War II attacked civilian targets. Um, responsibility for consequences. So even if a state was justified in going to war and it conducted its war proportionally and with discrimination between military and civilian targets, the war could still have very negative consequences. Um, so according to Augustine, a state is only absolved from the responsibility for these negative effects of its just war, if it was already a whole just war, if there are three additional criteria that are met. So in the first one of those is the action that had negative consequences must have been done with the intention to produce good consequences. The bad effects uh, that resulted were not intended and the overall good effects of the war must outweigh the overall damage done by the war. And in the case of World War II, that's very difficult. There's so many, um, there were you know, good effects. They had to, needed to um, stop the Holocaust and so forth. On the other hand, there are very bad effects of what also happened in the war. Um, and so certainly the bombing of civilian population, even if it has like the good intention as it sometimes uh, justified uh, with the atomic um, bombings was to, you know, prevent a lot, much longer military uh, war and so forth. Uh, um, nevertheless, because it was deliberately bombing a civilian population, in other words, bad effects that are intended, um, that wouldn't qualify properly under uh, Augustine's definitions. And so essentially to get to a just war by uh, the way it's outlined in um, Augustine's philosophy or theology, and also, you know, again, like I say, that that's the position still of the Catholic Church. It makes it so really, it's very difficult uh, to meet those criteria, even for just war. And so um, that's a look anyway at the ideas of pacifism, holy war, and just war. So now I want to look at just peace. So these other three are pretty deeply rooted ideas in Christian history. Um, just peace, which kind of fits in between just war and pacifism, is a newer idea. In 2011, it was adopted by the World Council of Churches, which is a Christian ecumenical group representing some 350 member churches worldwide. Um, although, as we've just talked about with just war theory, if you read that really closely, it argues that nearly all wars are unjust. Um, the Formulators of just peace kind of say, well, here the problem still is we're still really talking about war and you're thinking about war and focusing on war. 
Um, and maybe instead of you know like doing this half uh, glass half full and you know, glass, you can look at a glass half empty, a glass half full kind of thing instead. So if we change our focus um, to focusing on justice rather than war, um, that's maybe something that will help us to think about uh, promoting justice rather than simply uh, trying to justify the wars that we have. And so by addressing many systematic injustices in the world, just peace theory um, is, hopes to attack some of the root causes that cause war and thereby prevent war. And so uh, here's the logo of the World Council of Churches. Uh, in its formulation of just peace, uh, the idea is to seek justice in every sphere of, sphere of life, including uh, four contexts. And I'm just taking this from their formulation. So peace in the community, peace in the marketplace, peace with the earth, and peace among peoples. So peace in the community, they're saying, so that all may live free from fear. So the idea here is involving overcoming systematic, the systematic, systemic violence of poverty, racism, caste, sexism, other bigotry, and so forth that is um, uh, causing, uh, as a cause of injustice for so many of the world's people. And the goal here is to follow the admonition to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, peace in the marketplace is sort of the idea so that all may live with dignity. According to this formulation, justice in the marketplace involves overcoming the huge gap between rich and poor, enabling all people to live full lives with dignity regardless of class, gender, religion, race, ethnicity, and so forth. Acknowledges that overconsumption and deprivation are forms of violence. So the amazing um, differences in the way we live lives in the de developed world and in the developing world. Uh, it also seeks to cut military expenditures and end arms trade to put uh, to stop profit making from weapons of death and destruction. So peace with the earth so that life is sustained. The goal here is ending greed and violence against the earth um, by admi admonishing people to live in simple dignity, becoming stewards personally and together to overcome climate change and crises for the sake of our children and grandchildren and all future generations. And peace among peoples so that all human lives are protected. So the idea here is to confess the spirit and logic of violence is sin so that we may put human security before um, national security. So hum security of all humanity before individual national securities. Call upon nations to embrace truth, turn swords into plowshares, and to not learn war anymore, and to do things like working to abolish nuclear weapons that continue to threaten the earth with mass destruction. So nevertheless, um, just peace is distinct from pacifism. So we talked about um, the tradition in Christianity at the very beginning uh, to, um, you know, not have, to not promote any, any kind of war or violence uh, uh, in, in, in favor of nonviolence. Um, just peace is not a rejection of just war. Just peace acknowledges also what is called the responsibility pr to protect. So for example, when a people are facing genocide, as in Nazi Germany or in Bosnia or Rwanda, um, and so though to go back to Augustine and, and, and part of the just war theory is that you need to have a, um, a legitimate authority for which to uh, to go to war, and so in other words, to, to be able to do police actions and so forth, to reform international bodies such as the UN and others, so that they're able to act as their authorities that are justified in taking uh, police actions to, uh, to uh, fulfill the responsibility to protect. So those are the four approaches to violence. Um, uh, that have been presented, and so I wanted to look at each of those um, in a little bit of context as we continue to think about our role in Community of Christ. Um, we've traditionally, I think, been a church that, while we promote peace, I think our our underlying philosophy has been sort of in keeping with uh, 
understanding a just war as opposed to being a pacifist uh, church, unlike the historic peace churches. Um, nevertheless, there have been, uh, and we um, uphold in our, in our church, uh, people who are conscientious objectors, and they have been part of our tradition, but we also um, uphold the service of uh, members of the church who uh, are also uh, in, serve in the military. Um, so anyway, I think that's kind of where we've been. I think there's probably a lot of interest in this I newer idea of just peace because those are the kinds of things uh, that we promote and stand for all the time. Um, but and there's not very much interest in holy war, I think, in the church. But uh, there is a lot of interest still in also reflecting on um, uh, upholding nonviolence as, uh, as a mean to really... Um, live what uh, Christian teachings are uh, and to explore that further. And so that's my uh, presentation this evening. I will um, let Leandro say if there's any questions and comments that you guys have had, and I'm gonna get a drink of water. Um, yeah, so um, Leandro giving me a news update that just, I guess, is happening right now, or just happened. Um, at least I hadn't heard about it because I was busy making slides for the lecture. 14 children and one teacher are dead after a shooting at a Texas elementary school Tuesday. The 18-year-old suspect is also dead. Governor Greg Abbott said the deadliest school shooting in the U.S. at a grade school since the Sandy Hook, Connecticut, uh, shooting almost a decade ago. Yeah, so um, violence is continuing to be a problem um, uh, and all kinds of violence. So these, uh, unfortunately, school shootings and the, uh, the shooting last week uh, uh, that was racially motivated in Buffalo. Um, uh, you know, so these are, this is part of the conversation as we are looking at how do we, um, how are we able to stop violence? So Bob Garrison actually asked, what do we, um, how do we stop violence like the shooting at the elementary school in Texas today? So um, yeah, this is a, a, a question that the United States especially has to be um, wrestling with. Um, the example that we have, let's for example, in, in Australia, is that whatever it was 30, 30 years ago now or more, maybe 40 years ago, um, Australia had a, uh, you know, a mass shooting like this that uh, gave everybody kind of awareness of, of you know, how dangerous it is to just have all, just, just an overabundance of, of guns and they able to be in the hands of 18 year olds like this one and the one from last week in Buffalo. Uh, they had a nat nationwide program to buy back guns and um, have regulation and so forth. And Australia has uh, had almost no, I think, mass shootings ever since then and has been able to, uh, to deal with that. And likewise, uh, you know, like in countries, other developed countries like Japan, uh, where they don't just, I don't think anybody has any guns. <laughs> There's an almost, the, the number of murders is, is so negligible, you know, there's, it's almost, it's, it's so low, you know, whereas this kind of, um, there's an issue that has to be figured out um, in terms of um, uh, gun control in the United States. And that's not a popular idea because there's a lot of people in the United States who think that owning guns uh, should be an inalienable right, even though it's simply um, a misinterpretation of something that's in, written into the U.S. Constitution, which is filled with all kinds of flaws. It's not about not a list of of your God-given rights or something like that. But and nevertheless, um, until that's addressed, in my view, this was not going to ever stop. So, um, John Booker's full spectrum asks: Would Christ have been wrong for his violent actions when he overthrew? Um, uh, the changers temp, uh, changer tables in the temple, um, all violence would seem to say yes. So yeah, um, that would be an example. So when I've kind of shown some of the examples where you would have precedents, um, this would be an example where um, at the very minimum, 
uh, you know, this is a this is a violent act in terms of disruption against property. Anyway, um, it wasn't going and killing somebody, but it was a um, it was a disruptive um, an attack on on personal property. And so I think uh, you know, depending on uh, what kind of pacifist uh, theory you know you need, you know, when I was talking about like there's a difference between vegetarianism and veganism and pescatarianism and so forth, there might be some folks who um, are, have a nonviolence theory that can include um, attacking property because they don't, um, because maybe they don't, they're not, no, they're no respecter of property and Jesus maybe isn't a respecter of property. Um, and so maybe, it, maybe it's not inconsistent for him, but it's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily a, a full commitment to every kind of nonviolence. Stephanie Ceresi asks, considering Matthew 5, the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, how do you see Matthew 10, 34? I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Um, so what I would say is um, that when he's talking about that, um, the sword is um, in almost always in, as a, in, in uh, the New Testament is a metaphorical for um, for the word, and so when uh, even in the Battle of Armageddon, in the in the um, uh, in the Book of Revelation, which people kind of weirdly misinterpret as an atomic war or something like that, in modern times, um, the 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 angel that brings brings forth a sword, the sword comes out of his mouth because um, it's the uh, gospel that is divisive, and so um, in Matthew turn thirty four which is a saying that is not multiply attested. So it, we don't have that in any other. Um, so, uh, so it isn't, it isn't a saying that is multiply, atte multiply attested. So in other words, we not, don't have that in Mark and Q and John or something like that, or Thomas, it's only there. Um, but nevertheless, what it immediately goes on to say is, you know, that you're going to turn um, mother against son and so forth. Um, and so the idea is that, um, that this is a disruptive um, movement. And so what I, I would suggest is that what that means is we, um, you know, there's a bunch of these teachings that we've talked about before where the Jesus movement is kind of saying, um, we're, this isn't about complacency. It's not about um, your, your filial obligations and so on. You're likely to, uh, the gospel that we're having, the sword that is coming out of our mouths here when you are, when you are um, hearing things like, blessed are the poor, when you're rejecting, you know, when Jesus is commanding, give away all your property and go and give to the poor and follow me, um, that is going to cause your dad to be mad at you. <laughs> that will turn the father against son and, and so forth. And so that's what I would, how I would interpret um, Matthew 10, 34. JB says, what do you think um, of the current day justification of religious violence by pointing to historical crusades? Specifically, do you think the comparison is fair or lacks perspective? Um, so I guess I don't know. So if, um, so if, if there are Christian groups that are justifying um, being, you know, doing something violent because they say, well, in the past we had the Crusades and that went, those worked out really well, <laughs> then that would be a weird justification to make. I think that, um, that most, uh, that I don't think that, if I'm, you might not be meaning this, and so I don't think that Christians are relying usually upon the Crusades to justify um, as a precedent for that, showing that they should do that kind of violence today. I think that there's a general I think there's a general agreement in Christianity that the Crusades are not a positive aspect of Christian history. Um, I, I certainly don't consider them to be. I consider that to be, um, a, you know, a mistake. <laughs> you know, not a you know a bad mistake and atro atrocities, uh, a mistake that involved atrocities. Um, if other um, other religious groups are committing religious violence and they say, oh well, how can you blame us? Um, if let's say we Hindus who are right now destroying um, 
uh, mosques or India or, and, and ha causing discrimination against Muslims in India or something like that. How can you, um, how can you people in Christian countries uh, have any moral high grounds because you committed the Crusades? Um, that's also, I would say, that's very much lacks perspective because I don't think um, it's too far in the past to, uh, to make a fair comparison. Almost everything that we have to, um, in, in terms of what, everything that's going on in the world today, the legal framework for everything is pretty much from 1945 onward. And so um, it's, it's kind of hard to, um, to go back to, to the year uh, 1099 and, and say, well, you did this in 1099, that's getting to be too far away from anybody's um, uh, even, you know, any kind of memory that anybody even has. So. Daryl Scott, um, since government by definition uses violent or threats of violence to function, how do pacifists justify participating in politics? So yeah, um, so it is, it can be very complicated and in fact, um, there were several, um, there have been several, in the last century anyway, uh, Christian pacifists who's, uh, who take it to such a level uh, that they um, uh, also become, also uh, are essentially functional anarchists. So they don't think that there is any legitimate uh, government because the government does have to use violent and threats of violent to function. Um, and so that's kind of one radical direction you can take that. Um, I do not lean, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not really, I'm not necessarily, I'm not a pacifist in the first place. Um, I'm definitely a, uh, person who believes, you know, I, I do in that peace should be all of the, you know, the, the very last resort kind of thing should be the violence. But, um, uh, but I do think that that's a complex portion of what people, when people are philosophical pacifists. Um, it, that's one of the struggles that you have to have oh, in the end. Um, Thumper asks, uh, was the Germanic view of Christianity as militarist as the Roman view? So, um, so, so, so the functional, functionally, it's kind of an interesting thing. So when those Germanic tribes are, um, are, invading the Roman Empire. It's a Christian Roman Empire. The Germanic kings and their and their subjects, mostly, not everybody, are also Christians. Um, in both cases, uh, even though there is a, even though some Christians continue to be um, pacifists, and so, for example, in this same kind of time period, there is a Roman soldier uh, um, who converts, to, has a kind of a born-again experience, uh, who, who becomes uh, St. Martin of Tours. And so because he goes from being a, a soldier, I mean, he's a soldier, but he has a Christian conversion experience, um, he deserts because he says, I've now got to be a pacifist. And he goes off and he eventually becomes Bishop of Tours, although in the meantime, he's um, you know, persecuted for being a deserter and so on and so forth. Um, nevertheless, there were already from the from even the first century, but certainly the second and third and fourth centuries, um, Christianity is actually um, popular in the Roman army, and certainly, like I say, the emperors had become Christians at a certain point, um, and they are generals that are leading the war. Uh, you know, leading wars, and the and the soldiers are fighting in wars. So, so there had already been accommodation. Uh, you know, of Christians under of Christians serving in the military and, and so forth, and even leading militaries. So the Germans um, are also become have also become Christians, mostly uh, like the Lombards hadn't and so forth, but mostly they had, um, and uh, maybe the Lombards did by the time they got there. But anyway, they they um, but they've converted to Arianism, and so it is a um, uh, a different kind of Christianity, the Nicene Christianity, and so they are in schism with each other. They consider each other to be to be heretics. And um, in some ways it's a little, you, you're, we talked about how um, having wars with heretics has always been more justified, and so for both cases maybe the fact that um, everybody except the Franks, the Franks were Orthodox, but uh, Catholic, but everybody else, the, the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and the Vandals and everybody, they're all Arians. And so, um, and so maybe they're justifying uh, fighting the other Christians because they're, 
they're all heretics to each other and vice versa. Um, so Seth says, I'm curious about the origin of the exact phrase, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. So yeah, this is a quotation that I made that is a famous misquote. So, um, you know, there's like a bunch of, there's a bunch of quotes that are uh, very famous. So it's like uh, um, from uh, Casablanca, play it again, Sam. <laughs> He never says that, you know, so uh, Luke, I am your father, you know, um, you know, he doesn't, uh, you know, that Darth Vader doesn't exactly say that. So there are, those are both cases, those are paraphrases of a longer quote that have been smashed together. Um, and so, um, you know, you're, you're right that there is a, there's a shortened, shorthand version of this quote that I said, the lion shall lie down with the lamb and the child, a little child shall lead them. It's actually you know, I don't know, there's a leopard in there and there's wolves and all kinds of other creatures and so forth that are in this, um, uh, in the exact quote, which I don't have in front of me. So um, I don't know where the shorthand version comes from. It's, um, it becomes simply, you know, it's a simplified way of remembering a quote, like the quote from Casablanca or Empire Strikes Back uh, that people all say, but it never was, it isn't in the original. Uh, Galerio Deckel says, um, do you see traditional peace churches as misguided? No, no, no. <laughs> he said, he referenced that folks are in danger of becoming Mennonites or Quakers. Oh, yeah. No, I was being, I was being silly there, where I was saying that if you read the scriptures, um, you're in danger of becoming a true Christian, right? <laughs> you know, so, um, so that was a, that was, I was being a little humorous or facetious there. Um, no, I was thinking those are, that especially like Quakers are, um, uh, have very, um, it's a, it's a very, uh, honorable tradition that has, um, done so much good actually as the Quakers were, uh, all the way back, you know, very ardent opponents of slavery and helped end slavery. Um, there's all kinds of different ways that the Quaker tradition has, um, you know, despite its very small numbers that it's always had, uh, um, had an outsized impact uh, on the broader society uh, to do good. So no, I was I was actually um, I was actually meaning the opposite here when I'm saying they were in danger. Is you're like in danger of becoming a good Christian? Is what I meant. Uh, you know, like a like a Quaker. Um, so Steve Boley asks, can pacifism also strive for justice for all? Yes, <laughs> I think absolutely. So I so in that sense, I don't think that. Um, so this is why I think, this, so I appreciate this idea that they've introduced, the World Council of Churches has introduced with this idea of just peace as, they, um, as a way that we need to look at some of the bigger picture things and root question things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that people who are committed to pacifism aren't looking at root causes or aren't striving for justice for all. They are, yeah. So that's not, that's not the idea. Um, the... Um, the idea, I guess, is that um, is to is where are you placing your focus? So, um, Michelangelo Sanchez says, has pacifism triumphed in their goals? Why do government il and elites end up sometimes beating de being defeated by people that don't fight back? And why does it fail in other cases? Yeah. Um, so there's all kinds of different. Um, there's all kinds of different contexts that can happen in history. Um, okay, so he also asks, or is some other form of social violence also always necessary to achieve these goals? So, so it depends, you know, in all these kind of cases, you know, so there's all kinds of different reactions that can happen in history that are very interesting. So, um, uh, you know, there, the, you know, Gandhi had an amazing, um, uh, movement, nonviolent movement, that uh, internationally humiliated the British Empire, um, and so it caused um, you know the British Empire to pull out of of India, which uh, ruling India had been the number one uh, obsession of Britain for a century and a half or two centuries almost, uh, and yet and yet. You know, the, it happened very, very rapidly after World War II. Um, but in part, um, you know, there's also 
a bunch of confluence of things that happened right at that moment that maybe um, you know, caused the British that they just decided that, that, that the time had come for that. There were a lot of other factors, the um, you know, ascendant United States um, at the end of the war was very anti-colonial and imperial. Um, and there were lots of reasons why the empire, uh, the British empire was also, um, had been bankrupted and so forth. And just the ability to continue to um, uh, use the kind of imperial tactics to keep down um, local peoples, indigenous peoples um, were, were failing all over the place. Um, and so it's interesting that that, how rapidly that worked when it didn't work necessarily in other places and other places, um, uh, empires continued to fight and maybe massively massacre people in order to retain their colonial government. You know, the French are busy fighting uh, kind of a, a very brutal war to retain Algeria and things like that for, for a whole long time, although it wasn't a nonviolent movement to remove them. Um, um, likewise, uh, you know, the, an, interesting, an interesting collapse is the end of the Cold War, where you'd had these totalitarian governments that were highly militarized, that had uh, a vast internal uh, spying and police apparatuses and things like that, which um, collapsed almost without, um, almost without bloodshed. Uh, and so it was a, it, it's, it's interesting how sometimes these things happen, um, and then other times they don't. And other times, um, it seems like, for example, uh, massive pressure exerted on a uh, society for decades and decades um, produces the opposite result. So um, the U.S.'s policy of uh, containment for North Korea and Cuba, Cuba most preposterously at this point, um, you know, hasn't caused, uh, it hasn't, it hasn't, it's certainly North Korea's case, it, that's what that pressure is essentially what keeps the regime in place in a, in a, in this crazy weird backwards, uh, state, you know, as opposed to all of that pressure, uh, causing it to collapse. So anyway, you can't, you can't always say what's going to happen. Um, history is, uh, I don't know, like economics that way. So it's interesting. Uh, uh, Galerio Deckel says, uh, do you think it's community of Christ's peace place? I'm sorry place to make a global answer to our approach to nonviolence? Uh, would doing so conflict with the enduring principle of unity and diversity since folks inevitably would, do, would disagree with the approach? And what's your prediction for World Conference next year regarding a nonviolence resolution? So, um, so it doesn't necessarily conflict with our enduring principle, unity and diversity. So because we have World Conference resolutions where, um, where we will, uh, talk about things that the church in general is in favor of. Um, and so as a church, we'll have, there's, you've read more of the World Conference resolutions than I have, <laughs> Evan, because you have gone through them all. But, um, you know, there'll be resolutions that are in favor of certain things that not everybody in the church agrees about, um, which is fine because we have a principle of unity and diversity and, and, uh, and faithful disagreement. And so just because the church is upholding because of the World Conference resolution, um, let's say, you know, a position on, uh, on conscientious objecting or something like that. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody has to agree with that. And so it would be possible, I think, to, ha to pass a nonviolence um, resolution without violating either of those principles, um, except for the fact that um, I think as you're intimating here, um, I don't think that the, I don't think that the, um, the worldwide body ha has gotten to that place. In other words, I think that the that the place where the Mennonites and the Quakers are is a very admirable place um, philosophically, uh, and it may be a wonderful place for a church to be, but I'm not sure that everybody who's a member of our church has gotten to that place. And so, um, so I think that we might, what we, my prediction is that as we talk more about this, we're gonna think more about that this new fourth quadrant idea of, um, of focusing on um, just peace. Um, and then with, and then from there, you know, we can continue to uh, discern about and think about pacifism and nonviolence and do, do more nonviolence training, you know, for the decades to come. So I don't think that that'll probably, um, that'll probably pass 
in that kind of a form next year. We'll see. I don't know. Can you... Okay, people have also asked, um, can I explain what the DNC is? I, I need to, so the Doctrine and Covenants is a, um, an additional book of scripture in community of Christ. So the way um, the Bible works is, uh, the Bible isn't just one book, it's you know, dozens and dozens of books that councils of the church um, in the late antiquity um, you know, kind of all have started to agree should all be part of the canon, and so they got canonized. Uh, and then that Bible canon was changed by um, when the church broke apart in the Protestant Reformation, and so the Protestants decanonized a bunch of books for their canon of Scripture and so forth. Um, Community of Christ, um, as a Restoration Tradition church, um, uh, our World Conference functions for us like an early conference of the church or like the Protestant churches when they changed their canons. And so we can decide what is canonical, what is scripture for the church. And the way that works is the same way anything else, a World Conference resolution or anything else works. Um, so the, uh, the World Conference decides what is scripture. And so our book of Doctrine and Covenants um, specifically is the scripture that we keep adding to. And so uh, mostly, usually at World Conference, uh, uh, the, the person who is called to be the prophet for the church, one of the things that is one of their roles is that they can bring a document of inspired counsel to the church. The uh, church then ponders and contemplates, do we think that this inspired counsel uh, qualifies as scripture, and if so, then we can canonize it and we put it in. It becomes another part of the Doctrine and Covenants. Theoretically, though, we could canonize other things besides that if we want to, and we can also decanonize things. Um, so our day of Doctrine and Covenants is very different from the, uh, the one in the Utah uh, church, the LDS church. The LDS church, they don't really add anything to it. Um, they they, um, they added a bunch of extra Joseph Smith material, but it almost entirely relates to, um, to Joseph Smith Jr. and the early church period. They have a handful of other, uh, other sections that are in there, a, a vision um, by Joseph F. Smith and one or, two other, one or two other sections, and then they appended a couple official declarations. Uh, but generally speaking, it's, uh, it's very different and not a living document. Uh, so... Yeah, very good. Oh, um, yeah, so in, so we'll just mention here, Stephanie uh, mentioned LDS DNC, yeah, 9831, thy enemy is in thy hands and thou art justified. Yeah, that's not in, that's not in our Doctrine and Covenants. So that's one of the, um, that's one of the uh, sections from Joseph Smith's time period um, that in, in terms of a writing or thinking that the LDS Church added to its canon in the late 19th century. Okay, guys, <laughs> thank you so much. This was a lot of fun, and it's allowed me to um, put some of my thinking together as we uh, are preparing for, um, you know, getting this course uh, worked out and um, actually translated into to, uh, Polynesian, so that I can uh, teach it to the folks down there. And I'm going to be very excited. <laughs>